welcome to Resilient Retail. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I am honored to have you kind of kicking off this entire season one. <laughs> the uh, The purpose of the show really is, I mean, 2020 has been a heck of a year for everybody. I think brick and mortar retailers especially have been hit really hard, have been kind of tossed into what I've heard you say, like 2030 without any kind of preparation. And so this show is really meant to bring this this value to them and to to really help figure out what in the world to do right now. So I, I think you're the perfect person to kind of kick this off. I want to I want to start today with a little bit of a personal anecdote. Being an exec at Shopify, we're really well known for the e-commerce side of things. Mm -hmm. A lot of stores have closed in the last six months. On, on your personal kind of as a consumer, how you shop, do you tend to shop mostly online? Have you completely stopped shopping in retail since the pandemic? Or are you still seeking out that that retail experience as you as a consumer are kind of going through this, this 2020 whirlwind? Yeah. Uh, first, Kristen, thanks for having me on Resilient Retail. I'm, I am proud and, and frankly, I'm honored to be the first guest. Uh, I hope I set the right uh, tone for all your your <laughs> next amazing guests that you have on. Um, so it's it's a great pleasure to be here. Let me start by saying this: I it is a misconception because of my role at Shopify and my sort of public social media um, activity that I'm totally an online digital consumer. And certainly, I probably default to digital consumption or, or, or digital purchasing uh, through e-commerce. Because that's kind of I'm a you know I'm a, I'm a kid of the of the 80s and 90s, and so <laughs> by the time I, I really became a consumer, but by the time I was you know 18 years old or 20 years old, the internet has started really to develop, and so I grew up with the idea that you can buy stuff on marketplace like eBay. I think it was probably the first thing I ever purchased was was some sort of trading cards or something like that on eBay, some sort of memorabilia. Uh, same. Um, and that's Mine probably was my like first. A, an old digital camera on eBay. It was yeah, like, I was trying to think what I what I bought. Yeah. It, it may have been a pair of sneakers or it may have been something. Uh, it, it may have been, I don't know, <laughs> some sort of piece of memorabilia uh, that yeah. I wanted that I couldn't get anywhere else. So, but that's actually not completely accurate. Um, I love, um, and some of my most favorite purchase experiences and retail experiences have actually been offline. And I think what I look for as I think a modern consumer, that's what I call myself a modern consumer, I, I, I suppose, is that I look for value. Uh, I don't mean value in terms of pricing value. I mean experience, experience value. Um, so I wear a black t-shirt uh, every day. Uh, I have for <laughs> you know the last 11 years of being at Shopify. Um, and I buy most of my black t-shirts from James Purse. Uh, James Purse is a great designer. He's also a great brand. Um, why do I like James Purse? One, the t-shirts fit me really, really well. Um, they mm -hmm. have a, they have a different uh, sizing scheme than most companies. They go from zero, one, two, three, four, five. I'm not really a perfect small. I'm not really a perfect medium t-shirt, mm -hmm. but I am a perfect one uh, in James Purse. Yeah. So one is, I like the fact that they actually have been very thoughtful about sizing. But two, what I like about walking to a James Purse store in particularly in a pre-COVID world, is that fundamentally, uh, I'm walking in to have a great experience. They know who I am because I've been there before. They know what type yeah. of stuff I want. They're not going to show me uh, a white dress shirt. They're not going to show me <laughs> uh, a pair of slacks uh, because yeah. they don't want to wear that stuff. They're going to show me black t-shirts. And not yeah. just that, but they're going to explain to me why this new range of black t-shirt for this particular season uh, are unique and different and that these are Japanese cotton as opposed to some other cotton and that they have a certain GSM count. And I get the same thing at a place like Harry Rosen as well. Um, literally 10 minutes before we started talking, I got a text message from uh, one of the sales reps at Harry Rosen, which is a Canadian uh, luxury store. And he said, hey, I got some really cool sweatpants that I think you really like. Uh, do you like them? Sends me a picture. I say, yeah, I like them. And they're going <laughs> to, and, and either I'm going to go pick them up this weekend or they're going to drop it off at, at my house. So my view of retail is not necessarily divided between online and offline. My view of retail and my, my, my vision for the future retail is it's just retail everywhere. And it's all about yeah. consumer choice. And I, as a consumer, get to decide how I want to make that purchase. You made the comment earlier about the year 2030. What I've been saying, and, and I think what a lot of us at Shopify have been saying for a while now, is that it feels like from a retail perspective, the year 2030 has been pulled into the year 2020. And to be very, very clear, what we mean by that is, is, is the following. When I started at Shopify 11 years ago, e-commerce 
as a percentage of total retail was about 5%, something in that, yeah. of that nature, very, very small. And between like, you know, 2010 and, you know, January, 2020, it grew from 5% of total retail to like 15% of total retail. So we got about 10% an increase shifting over to e-commerce from traditional retail. Well, now as we sit here uh, in sort of the, the back half of 2020, it's closer to 25%. So we have had the same acceleration in digital retail over the last three, four months as we did in the past decade. Yeah. And which is crazy, right? It's just that is yeah. that is an insane amount of acceleration. Yeah. And so what it's done is it's forced a lot of retailers to rethink their entire business model. So going back to the Harry Rosen example, which is a set of really nice men's stores across Canada. Um, I may not walk into a Harry Rosen store for a long time. I may never walk back into a Harry Rosen store uh, for the next year or two, maybe a couple of years from now I will, but I still want to have a great relationship with them. And the way that I yeah. interact with that particular retailer is in a very personal way over text message, over walking to the store and someone calling me by my first name and saying, hey, Harley, I, I have a bunch yeah. of stuff here that you may really like that has been curated for you. But it's all about value in that way. Yeah. And I love I love the conversation about value because I feel like when we, especially on the Shopify side, when we talk about value and when e-commerce stores talk about value, a lot of times it comes around to the idea of you know discounts and price and convenience and all this stuff. But what you're saying is really value is so much more than just that that price or even necessarily what you walk away from with a the product. There's so many other aspects that go into value. And in the retail side, a lot of that is that experience. You know, it's when I uh, walk to the cafe that's two blocks down the street with my dog and they see us coming, they know that um, I'm going to tie up Cooper outside and they're going to come. And a dog and bowl him. is coming, right? And the dog bowl is coming and right. I'm going to walk in and they're going to say, oh, okay, it, you know, it's right now it's hot. So you're going to want the iced Americano. Uh, exactly. Hot that Americano. you always get. It's, got it's, you. It's, yeah. you know, I remember as a kid um, watching in movies uh, or even television shows, or maybe hearing people say this, like someone walks into a diner and says to the person serving them, I'll take, I'll take my usual. Oh, and I always, yeah. I always thought that one line, um, you know, I'll, t I'll t you know, do you want the usual? Yeah, I got the usual. No problem. Um, that shows such incredible care, empathy. That is value. Um, when yeah. I'm buying certain products, price matters to me because it's mm -hmm. a commoditized product. Uh, I just need to get it fast and 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 as as affordably as possible. When I'm buying other stuff, I mean, you know, black T-shirt for me is basically my my pinstripe suit. It's what I wear every <laughs> day. It's my armor that I go into battle with every single day. Yeah. Price is less of an issue. Comfort, fit is is. Uh, uh, longevity, uh, can I wear it for many years? Does it look better over time? Does it have a patina to it? Which these, uh, what I love about James Purse is a lot of their shirts have patina, meaning it looks better over time. Um, I don't want patina in a hat because I want the brim to look a certain way and I want, I want the crown to sit a certain way also. Yeah. A patina hat would, would look sloppy. Um, so the idea of this value equation, what matters is does the brand, does the retailer understand what is the consumer seeking? And I think the best retailers, the best brands, they have a deep understanding of what is the job, what is the role of their product to the end consumer. Something I want to I want to come back around to is this idea that uh, you you talked about it even in the last you know couple of months, e-commerce has gone from fifteen percent up to twenty five percent or over, and so there becomes this question that I know a lot of industry experts are kind of throwing out, like could e-commerce actually replace the in-person retail experience mm. completely is the apocalypse that we've been kind of talking about since you know you you see articles from like 2016 saying the retail apocalypse is here is it actually here now does this mean that e-commerce is going to completely up in the retail space do you see a future where retail is no longer a thing and everybody needs to be just online only or is that a, a very aggressive stance to take on it I think it's the wrong question. I think the question should not be, is e-commerce going to be the future of retail? I think the question is, what is the future of retail? And the mm -hmm. future of retail fundamentally is retail everywhere. And yeah. consumer choice will dictate that. You go back, I've, I've told this anecdote a couple of times, but it, it, it bears repeating. Go back to when you were a kid, um, whatever that thing that when you were eight years old that you really wanted was. I don't know what it was. For me, it was a um, it was a particular video game. I wanted this game really, really badly, and I remember I think maybe it was my birthday or something, something like that. I remember um, my dad and I 
Uh, we were living in Montreal at the time. It was uh, it was November. When my birthday is, and it's cold in Montreal in, in November. Yeah, and I remember waiting outside the store, and we all stood there waiting for the doors to open. And yeah. when the doors opened, we all rushed in, grabbed the game, went to the um, cash register, bought it, and left. That is a perfect example of how and when the retailer was dictating to the consumer how to make a purchase. Uh, you have to line up. We're going to open at this time. You're going to pay yeah. this way. You're going to do all these things in order to purchase. And if you don't do these things, you are not going to get the game. Yeah. So that is fundamentally how retail had been for a very, very long time. So you see all these different data points and, 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 um, these, these pieces of insight that suggest retailers use addicted to consumers how to buy. That's yeah. over. Now, we as consumers have are now telling the retailers, here's how I want to buy. I want to buy online, pick up in store, or I want to buy in store, have the product shipped to me, or I want to buy online exclusively, or I want to go to a pop-up, or I want to go for a great experience with a very um, knowledgeable salesperson in the store, and I want to try things on. That, I think, is, is where it's going. And so I don't think e-commerce is going to be 100% of retail or even 80% of retail. I think yeah. that some businesses fundamentally need to have a much smarter, um, much more sophisticated online presence with things like shop pay, with things like augmented <laughs> yeah. reality. So you can try things on or you can place pieces of furniture around your um, around your home the way Magnolia Shop does such a great job of. Um, and other retailers and other brands need to have an amazing in-store experience where you have knowledgeable staff and you have great music and you have you know cool design and great art. What I don't think needs to be the case, I don't think it's a one size fits all. And so my hope is that through this pandemic, um, what will emerge is a rethinking of by brands and by retailers and by entrepreneurs and businesses of, okay, what exactly are we selling and how are we selling it? And what is emerging to go back to the idea of resiliency uh, is that you are seeing a certain group of retailers and brands and entrepreneurs rethink everything. They are taking in all this new information insight and they're making new decisions and they're questioning old assumptions and they're pivoting and adapting in this incredibly inspiring way. And unfortunately, you have another bucket, which I would call the resistant retailers who are waiting for the pandemic to end so they can go back to the status quo. And I think fundamentally, that is, is not the right course of action. Because mm -hmm. whether or not this pandemic lasts for another two weeks or another two years, this is an opportunity for you to rethink the very nature of your business, the very nature of how you sell and how you, inter how, how you interact with your consumers. And I think this is going to be a time where the businesses, but also the individuals that are resilient, are going to look back and say, that was one of the most important times for our business's future. Uh, and the resistant ones are just going to you know, wave their hand and, and, and yell and, and lament, I can't believe yeah. this is happening to me. Um, what do I do? And, and, and they're not doing anything about it. If you look at the retailers and the, and, and the businesses and the brands that are doing the best right now in the middle of a global pandemic, unlike anything we've ever seen, <clears throat> all of them either have an entrepreneur at the helm or have an entrepreneurial culture. Um, yeah. And this goes beyond just selling physical products. One of my best friends is a guy named Steve Bechta, uh, well-known Canadian restaurateur. He's three of the best restaurants in, in Ottawa, uh, but really well-known. The day that COVID hit, March 15th, and things got shut down, I happened to be with him. We were actually skiing together. And um, I was in the middle of trying to figure out what was happening, and he was trying to figure out what was happening. And he's in the restaurant business and his restaurants <laughs> yeah. were about to close, right? Now, he only has a pro one product. It was delivering food to his customer inside yeah. a physical restaurant. Yeah. And within a week of that happening, you had this thing called Curated by Becta that, that came to life, which was this incredible, amazing wine, uh, online wine service, this meal kit service. And it has exploded. His entire business has changed for the better because he, he, you know, like any good coach or any good, you know, athlete, he's reading the scene, he's reading the room, he's reading the play, uh, he's looking at the field and saying, okay, what is happening? How is these changing? And he immediately, instead of lamenting and saying, this is going to be a really, I mean, it's, it is a tough time for restaurants, but he immediately pivoted and adapted to it. And it's resulted in an incredible new business that he never would have even 
thought about had it not been for the pandemic. And that to me is resiliency. And that's what I'm so inspired by. Um, and I'm watching it happen across every industry from healthcare to uh, the food and beverage industry to retail um, to, frankly, education. Some, I, I, some, fr uh, some friends have, have kids that are just starting school and university right now. And what's yeah. interesting is they're saying like some of their professors, they're nailing this virtual education stuff, these virtual lectures. And others are completely failing at it because they are mm -hmm. not resilient. They are resistant. Yeah. I love the dichotomy between kind of resistance and resilience, which does feel kind of like this, you know, dark side and light side or black and white way to approach these problems is you can you can kind of toss your hands up and say, this is going to be the worst year for my business and no one's walking by my store and tourism is down. Uh, living in Colorado, that's a big piece of the conversation is, you know, no one's coming to go skiing. Nobody can go skiing. All the hotels are closed. There's all these tourism aspects of the state. And, and so you're seeing this difference between the brands who are kind of going like, this is it. Like, this is, we're either going to close our doors or we're just going to fight this and we're going to be or upset now we're about gonna be it. A, or now we're going to be a hiking place. Or now we're yes. going to be uh, a socially distanced picnic place. Or now yeah. we're going to be, you know, we're going to create ropes courses. That, and, and you see this across the board. And I think the only difference between those that are resistant and those that are resilient is that, um, they actually use the change that is happening in almost like a to catalyze some new direction. And I think that's what I mean when I say that the resistant retailers are inspiring. They're inspiring me because whether it's a global pandemic or it's a global recession or it's a change in buyer behavior, resilient businesses and frankly, entrepreneurs in general will always find a way to survive because that's what entrepreneurs do. We are, <laughs> yeah. we, we, we look to be resourceful. We know we don't have unlimited resources. We know we don't have a limited amount of assets, but we always try to make the best of the current situation. And when that situation changes, we change with it. Remember, Shopify started as a snowboard shop. We then became the yeah. best place to go and build an online store if you're a small business. We then expanded beyond online to offline into social media and to social commerce and marketplace commerce. We then moved beyond small business to much bigger businesses as well. We then included things like payments and shipping. Like, <laughs> Shopify is the, it, it, for me, the reason I love Shopify so much, the reason I'm so proud of our company and the people that work here is because we embody that resiliency and we do it because we're all entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why that's why I love doing what I do and being able to to have these conversations is because we're actually able to talk to merchants who are living out this this resilience kind of motto. And I find it so cool that we, you know, we dubbed this show Resilient Retail. And I love that, seem, by the way. It's super cool. Uh, I love it. It can seem like this buzzword uh, that we're kind of throwing out of Shopify, but having you on in especially saying like this is something that we all live and breathe by. I mean, just looking at the the product line of Shopify, we released an entire newly updated point of sale system in the heart in of the In the middle pandemic. of a global pandemic where, where, where yes. physical stores were closed. <laughs> exactly. Because we understood that this is an opportunity for us and physical stores are going to be rethinking their businesses. This is a good time for them to be rethinking what software, what hardware, what, what checkout systems they use. Ex that's exactly right. But here's the neat part about everything we're talking about here. It all feeds back into one central premise, which is that if you can get good at being resilient, as Carol Dweck calls it, if you can have a growth mindset, you yeah. as a brand, as a business, as an individual are able to deal with anything that comes your way because you know that you have the ability to adapt and that adaptability, that, that's what's really needed here. Yeah. And one thing I kind of want to touch on is this idea of um, there's this word that keeps getting tossed around, which is omni-channel or multi-channel, which is is very like, you know, what does that even mean? What does it mean to be omni-channel? And something I've heard you say a lot is a, a lot of the resistant retailers think of omni-channel as a strategy, whereas the resilient retailers think about it as a tactic. Correct. Can you yeah. expand yeah. on what that idea means and, and what does it mean for, you know, Kim, who owns a clothing boutique in downtown San Antonio, and their foot traffic is down 90% than ever before. What does that difference mean between thinking of omnichannel as a strategy versus a tactic? And how do single merchants actually start to embrace that idea and actually put it out into the world so they can be this resilient retailer that we are talking up so much? Yeah. 
Well, let's use hypothetical Kim for a second, uh, just because mm -hmm. you, uh, you, you, you introduced her. So <laughs> hypothetical Kim, um, uh, has an online store. And at some point she reads a white paper or listens to some sort of keynote from some retail conference. And they all talk about omni-channel and multi-channel and all these sort of, you know, many channels, uh, model. Yeah. And she goes back to her team or she goes back to her, uh, her home office or her office. And she says, Oh, I gotta be omni-channel. Okay. So I'm going to open a brick and mortar store. Um, and she opens a brick and mortar store and no one comes. No one walks in, no one buys anything in the brick and mortar store. And now Kim is saying, oh my God, I'm omni-channel. I thought I was supposed to be omni-channel. Well, that's because Kim made a very fundamental mistake. Hypothetical Kim, I'm not talking about any particular Kim. <laughs> Hypothetical Kim made a really big mistake. Mistake was this, she thought that omni-channel was a strategy. And where she got it wrong was no. The strategy is sell wherever your customers may be hanging out. If some of your customers are hanging out on Instagram, you should sell there. If they are hanging mm -hmm. out on the main street in your town, yeah, you should have a brick and mortar store. But this idea that omni-channel is a strategy is completely wrong. The strategy is sell anywhere where potential customers are. And the tactic to do that is omni-channel, is having yeah. a brick and mortar store potentially, or a pop-up potentially, or being at a farmer's market potentially, or cross-selling on Instagram or Facebook or Pinterest or house or, or walmart.com. If that's, if that's, and that's the reason why the reason that Shopify supports all of these channels that I just mentioned is because we cannot dictate, nor do we know what is the right place for every merchant to sell. So what we yeah. do is we make it really easy for any merchant on Shopify to sell on walmart.com or on Instagram or on Pinterest, because there, there is a good chance that some of their customers are there. But the strategy is not to open up a brick and mortar store. The strategy is to get in front of consumers wherever they are. I think that's where people get it wrong. The strategy is sell anywhere you potentially have customers. The tactic to get there is by opening up new channels. Um, but just by virtue of opening up a new channel does not mean that channel is the right channel for you. Something that I, I kind of want to pull out of what you just said for the audience, because thinking about you know the the owner of the liquor store that is a couple streets away from me that their main audience was the college that's right in town. And for six months, the college was totally virtual and the college kids weren't here and they weren't coming into the liquor store. It it can feel when we're talking about omni-channel, like, well, how do I know where my customers are? How could I possibly know this? And you can look at e-commerce stores and almost get the sense of jealousy of like, they have all these years of data on their customers. But I actually think that brick and mortar stores have this advantage that is a little bit sneaky where you've had these one-on-one -on -one conversations and experiences with consumers for so long that you have almost richer data than say just a D2C business does yes, because yeah. you actually know the people. So then and, you can, and when you they're, can they're in your store that. and when they're in your store, you have their undivided attention. Yeah, which is not something you are going to get in an online context. So Never. yes, you have them fully focused and fully um, uh, present in your store. That is a, a unique opportunity for a brick and mortar merchant that an online merchant would have a more difficult time having a deep conversation. I mean, you can send a survey out, you can ask a bunch of questions, but that merchant that has that physical liquor store could have said to that student, you're a really good customer of mine. I don't want to lose you when you go back home. So what mm -hmm. can I do that's going to be compelling enough that you're going to still buy from me, even though you're not walking to my store. And I think yeah. that is the opportunity. And that is what I'm seeing uh, resilient retailers and resilient entrepreneurs do right now. And some of them are not just, you know, surviving they are They are thriving. And yeah, that's inspiring to me. Yeah, I, and I love those stories so much. Like the the local spin studio that I go to is they were able to open kind of right as things started opening, but they did all these things to actually change the experience. And you know, you have to go in and wear a mask, but now when you walk in, they actually have your shoe si shoe size saved into their thing. So they they come in and your shoes already sitting next to your bike, and your right. bike was in like a taped in square. And there's all these things they did. They partnered with the the letterpress store that was right next door to make an entire line of t-shirts to help the the businesses next to them. Amazing. And seeing those kind of things, it's just it's it's so amazing and inspiring. And I think is the heart of this show is that retail is never going to die because those experiences are something that us as humans are always going to look for. Right. That as much as social media allows us to connect, 
Yeah. There's still nothing quite like being in a in a physical space with another human being and uh, having those I agree. conversations. Retail will never die because it's always going to change and evolve based on what consumers need, based on the circumstances in the world. The key, though, to be timeless and to be successful over the long run is to be resilient, is to yeah. keep evolving with retail. And you can try random crazy things. Sometimes they work. They may not work as well uh, all the time. But the best entrepreneurs, I just have that in their DNA. And they're not, they don't yell at the clouds. They don't, they don't lament <laughs> the current situation. They yeah. find ways. And, and, and that's not to say, let's be clear, right? It is a very tough time for a lot of people right now. Unemployment is at an all-time high. Um, people are sick. People are dying. Like This is a really tough time. This has been a very, yeah. very tough year for a lot of people. Um, but through all this, the silver lining for me is watching these great entrepreneurs and these resilient retailers change everything and make it better. And some of them have decided to start making masks and others have decided to start making hand sanitizers. And so many great retailers uh, and entrepreneurs are finding ways to fundraise for their community, their, their local community. Yeah. Um, so that is, you, you can help but be inspired by that. And I think that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. And, and okay, so I have to ask you this question because it is every day I, I'm getting a tweet or an email or somebody asking me, especially in the brick and mortar space, what the heck is this holiday season going to look mm -hmm. look like? Especially when you're talking about brick and mortar stores who for a lot of them for many years have depended upwards of 60 to 80 plus percent of their annual profits on this kind of either one weekend in Black Friday, Cyber Monday or, you know, mostly for brick and mortar, it's kind of Thanksgiving through Christmas. There's this whole season now that has been almost upended in the sense where whatever worked last year might not work this year. And this is the, the ideology of resilience right here. Do you have any kind of tips for, for the brick and mortar retailers who are trying to plan for what is arguably the most unplannable event of all time yeah. right now? I, I think that things like gift giving, and buying something special for someone you deeply care about, that is timeless. That will always yeah. be needed. That will always be important. Um, some people can't afford to buy the same gifts they bought last year because they lost their jobs and so they may be looking for other things. Um, my advice to any retailer who's preparing for Black Friday, Cyber Monday or preparing for the holiday season is to rethink the way that you've typically engaged with your, with your consumer and your customer. Some re physical retailers, honestly, they need to think about turning their stores into um, a fulfillment center. A very yeah. simple film center where someone can easily buy something online and you use your brick and mortar store to do gift wrapping with your staff and you send it out. Other stores are going to need to figure out a way to make it a lot easier. If, if, if you can't have people congregating in a physical location and you're only allowed five people in at any given time, then maybe there's another way to do it. Maybe you're on your window, you have a bunch of different products and very simply taking out your iPhone or your smartphone and taking a photo of a QR code, you're immediately able to buy it and then it gets wrapped yeah. in the back and then someone brings it out to you. Um, the cool part about the holiday season of 2020 is it's unprecedented, which can sound very scary or it can sound full of opportunity. And yeah. I don't think there is any roadmap or any any guests on this podcast, no matter you know how great the advice <laughs> might be, is going to be a one size fits all. My yeah. advice is to be resilient, is to try a bunch of different things to experiment with it because you actually don't know this may be the future of, of your business. And the only reason that you may be experimenting with it is because you have to do it now. This is going to be a very important season for my wife and I in terms of gift giving, even if it's something small, like a, 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 or even if it's just a letter, uh, writing a handwritten yeah. letter to someone that I, I deeply care about, which means I need new stationery this year. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I know there's someone who has been admiring my black t-shirts. I want to buy them black t-shirts. <laughs> I do think this idea of gift giving in 2020, particularly as we went to the holiday season, will be incredibly important. And I think retailers should really think about, do I have enough selection here? Do I have the right SKUs? Do I have the right process and the right buying experience to make it easy for a consumer to buy gifts for people they care about, regardless of price? Um, yeah. Because frankly, I think we all miss our, our friends. We miss our family. We miss our coworkers yeah. and our colleagues. And we miss the people that yeah. we used to engage with. And I think a lot of us are, are looking forward to this season to find a way to reconnect with some of those people. And, and things like gift giving, no matter what the price is, I think it's going to be really, um, it's going to be a big part of the season. I, I love that out of this whole conversation, I feel like there's one major theme that I can pull out for the audience, which really just boils down to 
commerce and tech and the pandemic and all of the stuff that's happening and changing right now, at the end of the day, we're all still human beings and we all have human desires and we want to do things with other humans and we want to have these human experiences. And so even with everything changing and getting completely, you know, your strategies thrown out the window, being able to come back to that center of one, why am I as an entrepreneur doing this? What is my passion? And then who am I serving and how can I make sure that the human beings on the other side of you know, the dressing room door or the online checkout are having a great human experience, which I think is, I think is the epitome of what Shopify is about. And the mission of Shopify in general is to empower humans on every side of the aisle to continue to build their communities and societies and their dreams the way they do. So to wrap, I want to get really human with you. We've talked about what resilience means for Shopify, what it means for merchants, what it means for the online entrepreneur. But Harley, what does resilience mean to you in a very personal way? What does that word kind of bring up for you in your own personal life? Yeah. I have been able to, I fell in love with entrepreneurship a couple times. I fell in love with entrepreneurship when I was a kid and I was 13 years old. You've heard this story. I think there's an, oh, I want mm -hmm. to be a DJ. No one would hire me. So I started my own <laughs> DJ company, hired myself, which now sounds kind of funny. But at the time, that was a really, really big deal for me. That was a really I big bet. deal that I was able to do something that I wanted to do so badly with so much passion, with so much energy. Uh, and so that was when I first encountered entrepreneurship as a way to solve problems. The second and probably the more impactful experience for me with entrepreneurship was when I was 17. Um, mom and dad lost everything. Um, and I was, you know, I have two much younger sisters. My, my, my youngest sister is 10 years younger than me. So um, I felt this deep responsibility to not only help out, help myself and support myself while I was going to school. I was at McGill at the time, but also help my family. And once again, I used entrepreneurship to solve the problem, which was I needed to be able to make a living. And and but mm -hmm. still speak in school, be, still be in school concurrently, and and entrepreneurship saved me once again. Throughout my entire life, this idea of entrepreneurship has been the tool that I've always activated and took out of my tool belt whenever that I had a problem. And more and more, what I'm realizing is that I could replace the term entrepreneurship with adaptability or resilience. To me, resiliency and entrepreneurship are deeply, deeply connected. And I think entrepreneurship is one of the greatest ways for human beings to solve problems, um, to find their life's work, uh, to find their own identity. And I think in many ways, this current pandemic is allowing and enabling more people to consider the idea of entrepreneurship, people that never thought about it before. I mentioned on one of the earnings calls uh, a couple of months ago, um, a grandmother in uh, Northern Italy was doing incredible in-person pasta making courses for tourists who now has taken that entire pasta making course online and selling uh, selling it on Shopify. That is what I'm inspired by now. And so I am mindful and I am wide-eyed about the fact that this is a very tough time for a lot of people, but I'm equally inspired and I'm equally, I'm reminded of, of what an incredible opportunity entrepreneurship is for people that are looking to solve problems. And now, and right now, a lot of us need to solve a lot of problems. And so I love that there are new opportunities to talk about these things on a podcast like Resilient Retail. Um, and we talk about adaptability and we talk about getting out of your comfort zone. Um, but a lot of us didn't have to get out of a comfort zone in 2019. Mm -hmm. 2020, we did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Harley, for this has been such an inspiring and, and heart moving conversation. I'm sure the audience is going to agree with me on that. Thank you for coming in and sharing your stories and your tips and advice for everybody. This has been such a great conversation and I am so excited to see where this show goes and me where too. we go yeah. with Shopify in the next six months, six years, 600 years. It's going to be a great ride. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kristen. I appreciate it. And congrats on this new podcast. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited by it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.